Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of MWISE, the leading cybersecurity conference. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my two analyst co-hosts. We have Rob Strecce and John Furrier. We're doing the keynote analysis. Yeah. What a keynote it was. We had Kevin Mandia, the CEO of uh, Mandia, up there. For me, one of the biggest takeaways was he was talking about the innovation that we're seeing out of China. Um, he said that it used to be that Russia was the varsity squad. Now we're seeing yeah. China. Um, what, do, what do you make of that, John? I'm going to start with yeah. you. I mean, I mean, I mean China's I think, I mean, really... The China, first of all, China is absolutely a threat, completely number one. He even gave some stats. The FBI direct actually had more stats on that. If they line up all the personnel in the United States alone, they'd still outnumber them by 50 to one or 500 to one, big number. But I think the Mandians showed in their keynote that they have full command of what cybersecurity is, what it was, where it's going, and the threat to national security on a global scale. I think because of they're so frontline oriented, they have all the metadata and up to the minute um, visibility in the text, and they probably know more that we don't even hear uh, coming in there. So Mandy, obviously, very successful at what they do. But to me, the content was on point. Everything that we've been tracking, I've been tracking for 10 years plus with theCUBE, we've been seeing the China stealing intellectual property from American citizens and companies. No help from the government, um, no private-public partnerships developing. That narrative's completely changed, and Mandian has done a lot of great work with the people in that room, because there's now a call to arms. It's almost like the militia was the companies themselves that to fund their own people. Now the industry's now changing, Robin, maturing with scale, next level yeah. cloud scale, and as the AI gift comes into security, you're going to see a major changeover, in my opinion, of productivity, fatigue, burnout, and an opportunity, and Dave Vellante posted on Twitter, is it an opportunity for the defender or the attacker? Content on point, well positioned with the AI, pragmatic. I thought it was a great keynote, and good timing too, and they had the FBI director. He, I was skeptical that he would be on point. He even hit, hit a home run. So, you know, to me, it's a national security imperative. Companies need protection. We're getting killed. There is a cyber war happening. Finally, someone else is saying it, besides us on theCUBE and everyone else. So, you know, it's a real cultural shift. I think it's going to be a game changer. And again, right on point, I thought the keynote was fantastic. Yeah, I, I want to I want to go to you, Rob, and ask about what you made of what he said about AI. He really struck an optimistic tone when it came to AI. He said it is the answer. It is going to address the problem of the overwhelmed security team. We're, we're not quite hearing as much optimism. And what, what do you think? I, I think he tried to pull it back and be very optimistic. In fact, I, I thought it was, out of the security conferences I've been to, this was <laughs> probably the most you know, yeah. positive set of keynotes that I've seen. Not everybody knows it's a tough job and it's very hard. I mean, again, going back and talking about how you know um, the MITRE you know had 41 different things you had to be right on to be yeah. able to protect yourself, and how AI really is going to go and help that burnout and help to do that. And you know, again, I think it's one of these things that if you're not embracing AI. Yeah. You're, 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 you're screwed, I mean, and I think that was his message, and I think even with Mandiant, who has a lot of analysts, physical people, involved in their entire go-to-market and entire services that they provide, I think that he was even, you know, showing that we're going to make good analysts, great analysts. We're going to make those people who are first in, we're going to make them even better with use of AI, and I think that was key. Yeah, and I thought the, uh, the uh, John Mandia's key points were layer two defense, AI is a great advantage for the defender now, so avoid the burnout, and then the continued private partnership. And he hit a couple things I just took notes on that I thought were notable. Um, there's need for a modern defense, it's the next evolution. Um, this whole China is the winner, you brought up varsity, he actually used that term, I like how you brought it in. They're the winner, they're on top. Russia dropped, now one nuance that came out of that is that Russia, because of the Ukraine war, has been almost fractured. They talked about the, the, um, the, um, the leaks the, uh, the, um, that came out Conti from the, the Conti leaks, right? So the war of, in Ukraine has also taken down Russia's focus, either because they're leaving the country and or finding domicile somewhere else and or distracted by the war. China now becomes number one over Russia. So that was interesting. And the other nuance that I squint through was, Rebecca, was the term e-crime versus state actor. Mm -hmm. And that's important definition because state actors are the countries, and in, in our doctrine of war, if the country attacks another country, we would counter attack. That's our kind of doctrine for um, maintaining peace. 
the state actors are employing e-crime units using kind of off-book operations to camouflage and obfuscate their role. This has been going on for a year, so now it's out in the public, they're continuing to talk about it. So that came up in the panel, and then finally, zero days are on the rise, okay? Zero day attacks are on the rise too. So again, another macro stat. So chock full of stats, Rob, and it's like, obviously, yeah. the trend is zero day, and a lot of area to hit. And you got, you got the, the, the attack in Vegas, casinos as well. Yeah, no, I, I think even, as part of the panel, and a lot of it, and they said, you know, kind of last year was a dip. I think they, they said there was either a total of 51 last year, and we're already at 63 this year, on the way up to, you know, past 80, where we ended up in 2021. So I, I think, again, part of it was, hey, things slowed down. We've only seen them slow down when there's like Chinese New Year, uh, and they take a break for the weekend. Um, but, you know, you start to look at it and go, don't be surprised if those Russian uh, act actors, bad actors, <laughs> get involved again in going and trying to raise money. And I thought, again, looking at how uh, the DPRC, or DP DPRK, sorry, was uh, funding their nuclear weapons program and how they were using crypto mining, basically, you know, embezzlement, to go and do that was pretty fascinating in how you know they were tracking it. I think that was Jackie uh, Burns Coven who was talking about like her study of that as well. Yeah. Rebecca, they, they named the top five uh, countries. Well, they won four countries and then a group: China number one, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and then cyber criminals. Right. That was interesting. They put that as almost a category of itself. They also pointed out from North Korea standpoint that they're really good at social engineering. They take their time over the target, month or so, but also good at supply chain hacks, which came up, was interesting. But the stat that was interesting was the money. Um, I think it was um, the woman on the panel, I forget which one it was, I think it might have been Maddie Stone. Yeah, it was Maddie Stone. She yeah. said that um, the estimate from uh, North Korea this year was, last year was 300 million. 3.6 billion all time yeah. for Korea, mainly crypto, smash and grabs, and or social engineering hacks. I mean, it's a, Korea, North Korea is doing well on the income sheet, Rob. Yeah, and I, I think that, uh, and I think that was Jackie Burns Coven also on that, on the stat, because she was the one, it was very fascinating how they were tracking that. And to your point on social engineering, how people are being notified by the FBI, hey, you have somebody you know, from Point Yang, inside your IT organization who actually works for there, and they're being notified that they've hired somebody. I, I, I think, again, part of it was, hey, these people are very sophisticated at this, and they're really good at that social engineering. Yeah. Being able to go in through LinkedIn, through other things, interview, and get jobs. Yeah. And I think also part of that was very interesting was how they're doing this, not just over one month or two months, how they have that whole supply chain attack and look to do that. And I, my, my, mine and John, one of our favorite words came up, S-bombs, was brought up. I so know, I, I, I love S-bombs. -bomb. Software so. bill of materials, yes. what's in the software? Yes. That came up. Yes, it did. But going back to what you're saying, I mean, this is what Kevin Mandio was, was, was hammering, was getting into a security mindset. Yeah. He said that a lot of CISOs he talks to, they say, I don't think people are taking this seriously yeah. enough. And he said you need to assume that your employees are going to fall for these social engineering attacks. You need to have board and executive modeling. You need yeah. to do tabletop exercises where people are understand, really yeah. grasping yeah. what a worst case scenario yeah. looks yeah. like. Well, I, I, I like the whole tabletop, and if you oh, haven't done one. Oh, I know, that resonated one, with me. Yeah, with, haven't done one in two years. Yeah, <laughs> the world your, has changed with a your, lot. With your board and your execs. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think it, it has to be an all of the above strategy, and you have to have that buy-in. You got to take, it's a gut check, it's a leadership check, it's a systems check, it's a process check, it's a, it's a state of the art, and we heard uh, the guest came on earlier uh, from um, uh, first guest, Brian, CEO, Brian Dye, he said if you don't have AI built in by the end of the year, you're, you're going to be, drunk at the wheel, I've had the exact other words, but that came off well. The other thing he mentioned on that point is what's next with LLMs and AI. He actually mentioned LLMs specifically. He thought that that's going to be a great opportunity to avoid the burnout. Rebecca, I know you know a lot about the future of work and we're talking about you know, how to get skills. Budgets aren't expanding at 10X. The data is expanding at 100X. The threats are coming in at high velocity. There's no budget. You got to get the productivity in there, but don't burn out. How do you be a jack of all trades and master of everything? 
Well, exactly, and I think that if, if, if using tools like AI tools to help you get to help you accomplish some of the more tedious tasks, the more the more boring things, that you, you know, the rote things you don't necessarily want to spend your time on will allow you to, to do the things that are more enjoyable, more interesting to you, yeah. and actually have more value add for the organization. And another thing is, if AI can take care of that those tedious tasks for you, then you have the opportunity to just really get to know yeah. your system inside and out and really yeah. understand what it is because that is one of the first defenses yeah. is to really know what you're dealing with. And, the, and I brought up file transfer protocols and, and software, Rob, as well as the SBOM in context to, there's a lot of stuff that's not patched in your organization that you might not know is not patched, so that's got to be table stakes number one. But what's interesting about that file transfer, uh, move, I, move, it, move it saga, I was a victim of that. Yeah. I got notified um, on the progress software, that was the big, uh, breach in 2022, um, the impact today is still being felt. So this concept of open source is going to be a big issue. So Adam Selesky was quoted on Thursday, we weren't at the press conference, but uh, Adam was taking a very hard line on open source at AWS, which, David, you don't see them do that for that right. one reason. About data in AI, the data in the, and we coined the term data supply chain on theCUBE, I don't think anyone's used that term before, but like software supply chain, you now have what's in your data right. supply chain. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that, and I, I think that's the next step, and I'm, I'm interested to hear as this week goes on, how they look at that as well, because it's not just about the actual you know, bits that are the software underpinning, it is the data and injecting yeah. fake data, and how yeah. do you understand that, and I think part of that Kevin actually talked to that a little bit about misinformation and disinformation and how you actually gather on top of that. I know we'll dig in with him tomorrow as yeah. well. The other thing I wanted to bring up um, for you guys too to talk about is this uh, Sean Lingus, Lengas, the CNN cybersecurity reporter who's moderating the panel, he brought this up around how we can speak native normal <laughs> <laughs> language, yeah. not cybersecurity jargon geek, which we speak, right? So like, um, that's huge for society as we try to get lawmakers in positions of power to and figure out. And employees and, too. and employees yeah. and family to saying, hey, two-factor two, <laughs> two authentication. What? Yeah. Don't use your phone. So normal, normal people are just using apps. Again, they are also potential social engineering victims inside organizations. So the hygiene and usage around what is cybersecurity, that to me was a very good sign, Rob, because that means that we're moving out of the vertical of narrow cybersecurity to mainstream FBI director, heads of companies, this is mainstreaming. Yeah, and I, I think the fact that they brought up the whole new SEC regulations, and didn't really go too deep into that, but 72 hours, I thought, uh, I think it was uh, on the panel where they talked to that, it may have been actually one of our next guests, Selena, who talked about the fact that you don't even know that you've been hacked within 72 hours, so can you, yeah. how, can you have an incident response that has a 72 hour SLA? I, I think that was really yeah. interesting. And so I talk about mainstream, when everybody has to report on it, yeah. you know, within four days, that's pretty mainstream. I, the other uh, notable thing was protect your goods, right? And I, they talked about banks becoming more like crypto firms, and crypto firms becoming more like banks. Yeah. Everyone's a target. The other thing I found interesting was how they were telegraphing how these um, social engineering, I call them sleeper cells, go out and interview for jobs and in the positions, and then also spoofing as a researcher mm -hmm. to yeah. target other researchers, and that was reported by Mandian, and that's very smart from a bad guy perspective. Like, hey, befriend, ask for advice. Using obsequiousness to gain trust. Yeah, show me your architecture, exactly. can you train me? What's your key path? And the research, <laughs> I mean, so much organizational behavior research, research yeah. shows that people just want to be asked for help, want yeah. to be seen yeah. as experts in their field, and so when they have someone coming forward asking them for yeah. a request or just to be smart around them, they will say, sure. Yeah. Did you yeah. see yeah. Selena Larson's response? I, of course I want to help someone. Someone says, hey, what do you do? I want to talk about my job and help right. someone else. Yeah. Mentoring, all those kinds of things. And I think that, to me, put an exclamation point on Kevin's point that everyone, assume that everyone will be socially engineered yes. at some point. Assume that... Uh, there's a ruse for everyone. There's a ruse yeah, for everybody. Exactly. 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 So, I mean, we're, we're, we got to wrap up here soon, but I want to just go back to the optimism that we, that we saw on the stage. Yes, there is a lot of of, of things to be worried about, things that should keep us all up at night. 
Um, but there really does seem to be a movement of trying to get more yeah. public-private partnerships. Chris Ray was up there trying to recruit, <laughs> yeah. trying yeah. to get more people to say, okay, we need to, the public, the, the private sector is the goalie, the government is the offense, we need more risks and repercussions for these bad actors. Rob, do, do, what, do you, what are you hearing in the conversations that you're having? Are, is there as much optimism? Uh, there are, and I, I think again, it's, it's, it's the fact that there is so much volume, but there are tools and community to come together. And I know that they have some stuff laid out for tomorrow that I won't go into that really talks to it being a community. And I think that's really where MYs and this conference is really about community and the security community coming together and being able to be a security you know, team unto itself in that yeah. public-private partnership. I, I think you know, there is more. I think the government is starting to realize they need help yeah. and companies are being more forthright with yeah. it as well. I mean, I think, I mean, I've, I kind of felt that the optimism was more urgency, less optimism, more positive urgency that we got to get our shit together yeah. as an industry. And I mean that because we're on the heels of a week after the MGM hack that they're fighting through. We were there in Vegas. You're seeing the landscape from the foreign adversaries on the cyber war, that's laid out clear as day. I mean, we're optimistic to protect our freedom, I think, in America from an American standpoint. So I think that to me felt more optimistic, like AI could help us be in good shape. The thing that jumped out at me was, Brian Dye talked about this on the first segment, is the speed of the game is so fast, and then the comment Kevin made is that IT and technology proliferate faster than we can secure it. And so this idea that the government has to rely on the private sector to lead in the leadership, absolutely critical. If we go the other way with the government's the pace car, it's going to be a disaster, at least in my opinion. So I think good balance. I think the recruiting is legit. The FBI should be embedded and maybe, maybe people are afraid. I mean, it's not the first call you think, well, hey, let's call the FBI and hang out and have a couple of beers with the FBI guys and show them our I stuff. I think they got some you know, stories. Yeah. I think it'd be, I think so, but be I a think, good hang. But I think it's positive for the industry that the conversation is going mainstream and that they recognize the problem. Yes, and I think you're right, that it's, the optimism was maybe not the right word, but urgency. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But this has been such a really fascinating keynote analysis. We're going to get yeah. into all of that and more on more CUBE interviews and, and tomorrow's sessions, as well as more today. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Stretchy and John Furrier. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of MWISE.